Hey there, it's Tom Hollingsworth, and of course, your boy Rich Straffolino. We're about to do this Gestalt IT rundown. And uh, Tom, are you excited? Are you ready? Uh, are you raring to go? I am raring to go. Your enthusiasm, as always, is um, it's like swine flu. <laughs> it's infectious. Um, sorry, I don't mean to offend anyone with uh, with swine flu. I know it's very serious. Um, don't know why I chose that one. Could have gone with avian flu. Seems uh, less timely. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, Spanish flu, definitely a no-no. It's a catastrophe yeah. on a, a human scale, really. Still still too soon. Too soon, yeah. It's like World War One humor. Just can't go yeah. there, you know? Do I want to make a joke about the Battle of Verdun? Of course! Uh <sighs> Good times, Tom. Lots of IT news. There's like so much scary security. <laughs> I mean, it's not even, it's not scary, but it, all the headlines are very scary sounding. Uh, so we're going to start off the show with that. Does that sound like a plan to you? It sounds like a plan. Just let me get my tinfoil hat. Oh, okay. Um, that'd be great. Now, is it as effective if you use aluminum foil? Uh, pretty close. Mm -hmm. um, I, I prefer stainless steel foil, but that gets really heavy after a while. I go with... Um, uh, like a, uh, a patty paper hat, but it's very small and, uh, but my hair doesn't stick to it. So it works out uh, very well. It's good for pastries. Um, all right, I'm going to press some buttons. Music's going to play. And then we're going to talk about some news. Does that sound like a plan? Yes. Okay. Here we go in three, two, one. Hello all and welcome to the Gestalt IT Rundown, your weekly look at the IT news of the week. I'm your host, Rich Straffolino. I'm an editor with Gestalt IT. Joining me from across time and space, the one, the only, the networking nerd himself, Tom Hollingsworth. Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I am joining you from across time and space. However, I am not tweeting from space because that's Elon Musk. <laughs> He seems uh, to have that on lockdown, and we don't want uh, to make Mr. Musk upset. I lost something on my screen, and that's why I'm looking off of it. We're going to get started now with a little section we like to call news or not. This is where we maybe have a little too many, too much news out there. We want to cover it all, but we can't give it a full discussion. So I turn to Tom to tell me if it is news or not. Let's get it started with some security news. Uh, first up here, we have uh, some, uh, some DNS, uh, or I'm sorry, some uh, AWS news. AWS DNS servers were hit with a DDoS attack yesterday, October 22nd, resulting in sites and apps uh, relying on the backend Amazon hosted systems to either get error message or time out in some instances. The attack started at 9 a.m. Eastern time and affected S3 storage, Amazon relational database services, uh, SQS, CloudFront, Elastic Compute uh, Cloud, and Elastic Load Balancing. The attack seems to have ended around 6.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, so sustained for quite a bit of time. This wasn't a complete blackout, but you saw all sorts of reliability issues while this was going on. Being the 800 pound cloud gorilla uh, paints a big target on your back, but is DDoS related unreliability news or not here, Tom? I think it's news because it finally hit Amazon. Uh, this is one of the things that a lot of people have been talking about recently is how can we deal with terabit sized DDoS attacks? Um, there's been some actually some good discussion as of late. Um, I know that uh, Carrero and Juniper are working on a way to scrub it uh, at wire speed. Now, I don't know what's running in Amazon's data centers and I don't know what's front ending all their DDoS stuff uh, because a lot of times this is farmed out as a service. But Amazon better start looking at this because it's only a matter of time before these things scale up to the point where even they can take down Amazon. Yeah. And when you have, I mean, there are not going to be an end to the amount of uh, things that can be used for either botnets or, you know, I don't know what the origin of this is, but with even more IoT devices every single day out there, theoretically, that leads to, uh, you know, more compute ends that you know, can be used in this kind of DDoS attack. So, uh, you know, probably best to get uh, your ducks in a row. You would think, I was very surprised to see Amazon was susceptible to this considering they run the internet. Um, but it shows that, uh, yeah, anybody can get hit by this. Next up here, mm -hmm. uh, malicious actors access the internal network of Avast with compromised VPN credentials on a temporary account. 
uh oh, it looks like the plan was to uh, uh, do a supply chain attack against the popular Windows utility CCleaner, which already had a supply chain attack done against it in 2017, although it appears that these are unrelated. It just happens to be a very popular target. Avast pushed out an emergency update, although they're saying no malicious code was injected. They had a lot of time to work on that since hackers gained access on May 14th, and it was only detected on September 25th. Avast getting hacked here, Tom, news or not? It's news because security companies aren't supposed to have this happen, but realistically speaking, it's like the Pacific Rim countdown clock that's on the back of the wall. You know, the time since the last hack, we just reset the clock and now it's going to start counting up again and it's going to have to get reset sooner or later. Yeah. And I think the big thing here is one, this indicates a very sophisticated attack because taking place over that amount of time, clearly it wasn't like, Hey, we just want to get in here and, and you know, dump a file in, um, you know, in the repository for CCLAN just to prove that we were here. They were, had a long-term plan to eventually put some code into there, uh, similar to what was done in 2017, uh, where the, the app was actually compromised uh, for a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, scary on that. And in terms of the level of sophistication, it theoretically takes to do something like that. Yeah. All right, speaking of compromised VPNs, NordVPN confirmed it was hacked with a server accessed in March 2018 by a insecure remote management system left on by the data center provider that Nord claims it wasn't aware existed. Otherwise, it would have been monitoring that as a potential avenue uh, of exploitation. The server did not contain any user logs. Nord actually, I mean, as a policy says, they don't do any logging of users and the applications on it don't send or receive any credentials, meaning the only attack that the, act, that the uh, malicious actors could have done was to do a single point man in the middle attack done against very specific users and traffic, essentially mimicking a website that you wanted to see there. But NordVPN getting hacked here, Tom, news or not? I think it's news because NordVPN has been doing a ridiculous amount of advertising as of late on a lot of uh, YouTube channels and things like that. So, you know, make sure you are not living in a glass house as you throw rocks to tell everybody that you're the most secure. Um, also, a uh, big, big shout out to uh, the security community that basically echoed something we've been hearing and saying for years. If you don't control the terminal point of your VPNs, you, you don't have real security because just because a VPN terminates in somebody's data center doesn't mean that it's terminating in a secure, safe location. So audit those logs, buddies. Yeah, seriously. Well, and and although it it is, you know, this is kind of like a little micro trend, I guess, in security in 2019, is that these remote management systems on these servers themselves are just these huge uh, surface areas for exploitation that I think, I mean, maybe the implication is these have been used for attacks that we just haven't been aware of for quite some time. And now we're just getting some visibility to how prevalent that is, or, you know, people are just discovering those for the first time with new, renewed sophistication. Yeah. All right. Uh, speaking of being sneaky, researchers at BlackBerry's security subsidiary Silence discovered obfuscated code embedded, wait for it, Tom, in a WAV file. Upon opening the WAV file on a host machine, the file extracts a DLL in memory and then extracts a Monero CPU miner. That's right, crypto jacking. The file is embedded in the WAV using least significant bit steganography, which embeds the malicious information across the rightmost bit in an individual byte. So just that last number causing the WAV to sound either normal or like white noise. So when you click on it, it doesn't sound like some crazy weird hack thing. It just sounds like whatever you thought it was when you clicked on it. Although, fun fact, don't why, one, if someone's sending you a WAV file, they're a jerk because send a compressed file. Don't don't ever do that. Uh, but to never click on anything in that anyone sends you ever, I guess is my security advice here. Uh, but uh, uh, sneaky WAV files here, Tom. News or not? Nah? I'm going to go with nah here. Um, awesome point of contact. Awesome proof of concept. But uh, if you're a fan of uh, hacking movies, I go back to sneakers. Um, when Robert Redford <laughs> had to hack a keypad door, it's like, okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and then he kicks it in. Um, yes, you can get really sneaky injecting DLL files into uh, memory, but realistically speaking, most people are just going to spearfish the, uh, the idiot CSO, CXO person that just clicks on everything that gets sent to their email. But this is probably the biggest audio hacking news ever since uh, uh, Draper's uh, 2600 Hertz Captain Crunch whistle. <laughs> <laughs> um, this always reminds me of the things that Ben Gurion University puts out. They have a security institute there, and they always are like, you can exfiltrate data with the sound of a hard drive spinning. You know, we can turn it into Morse code or, or you know, do ones and zeros with that. So, yes, really interesting. Um, 
And if it's being exploited in the wild, uh, again, don't don't ever click on WAV files. Those are bad people sending those to you. Uh, and finally, here on news or not, in non-terrifying security news, SAP inked a three-year deal with Microsoft, which will see Microsoft sell SAP cloud services into a bundle called Embrace, which is a little too clingy for my taste, selling these directly through field organizations to customers who will run uh, SAP in Azure Cloud. This is just the latest in a number of uh, Microsoft-related deals with SAP, although SAP is not being exclusive. They have similar bundles with AWS and Google Cloud. But Microsoft and SAP getting cozier news or not here, Tom? Not really. This is SAP deciding that it's going to bet on all the horses in the race, and whichever one seems to be winning is the one they're going to feed the most oats. Um, this is diversification in case Amazon suddenly, I don't know, gets DDoSed or you know, because that would never happen. Uh, no, is this is you're going to see this repeatedly. Everybody's going to support AWS and Azure. You know why? Because you don't know which one's going to be king in the next five years. And I still think there is some time to maybe uh, bifurcate the uh, based on use case. You know, I mean, Microsoft has such specific integrations that depending on the setup of your organization, you know, uh, adds to a lot greater efficiency. You know, if you're an all Microsoft shop, it makes a lot of sense to use Azure as opposed to, you know, uh, um, uh, you maybe some uh, a newer startup that's, you know, doing everything in the cloud and that kind of stuff. So um, I, I think playing the field and maybe a recognition that there isn't going to be that, you know, it isn't just going to be AWS and a bunch of people with 5% market share. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that Azure is, is, a, is a player to say, I think, I mean, I don't think that's a new realization by SAP by any stretch. Um, with all this terrifying news here, Tom, I thought up for discussion first was an interesting announcement again by Microsoft. We had a lot of Microsoft news here today. Uh, they announced the Secure Core PC initiative, uh, which will work with chip and computer OEMs to follow security best practices of isolation and minimal trust to the firmware layer or the device core that underpins the Windows operating system. So what does that um, actually mean? Machines will be available from Dell, Dynabook, HP, Lenovo, Panasonic, uh, and uh, as well as the Microsoft Surface, with Microsoft giving the Surface Pro 7 and HP Elite Dragonfire laptops as examples of these actually being implemented. The certification will require Windows Defender implementing a, a system guard secure launch, which will reinitialize the system into a trusted state after a hardware start, after the physical hardware starts. It will also include trusted platform module 2.0 to verify that hardware is actually what it says it is and system management mode to monitor firmware. Tom, do you see this having a meaningful impact on security or is this just kind of a cert CYA for IT and privacy uh, conscious companies? Rich, are you currently using the TPM chip in your laptop? Of course I am. Rich, do you even know if the laptop you're currently using has a TPM chip? Uh, I mean, I, I, I print out my TPM reports uh, on a timely basis to make sure that those get the correct cover letter. Uh, I, I, have, I honestly have no idea. And that's why this isn't a big deal. Congratulations, <laughs> Microsoft. You just managed to make a secure boot zero trust laptop that absolutely zero people care about. Do you know why ultimately nobody cares about it? Because until it gets in the way of you doing your job, it's nothing. Think about the T2 chips that went into all the brand new Macs and the brand new uh, 5K Retina Display Max, uh, iMacs. Those are great. Everybody loves them because they prevent you from fixing things without taking <laughs> stuff to an Apple store. But realistically speaking, just because it's secure booting so that the display won't come on unless the firmware is validated, nobody cares. Um, ultimately, you know what this is? This is a remote kill switch that no one's ever going to use. Just like it's a remote way to wipe iPhones and iPads that get lost that no one's ever going to use. But so for congratulations for, for building... For industries for what? For uh, ultra secure yeah, uh, uh, financial, you know, yeah, communications. I mean, you know, when you're, when you're doing fleet management on that level and, you know, looking at the partners, I, I think it is interesting that you're seeing, you know, more of the the corporate OEMs there. I mean, the fact that Panasonic is on there, they only make tough books that are only put in super specialized environments. Um, it says to me that they definitely have those kind of verticals in mind when they're they're setting up the spec and setting up the uh, certification. Do you know why nobody that you've never heard about these ultra hyper secure phones and ultra hyper secure tablets? Because the companies that make them are not Dell and not <laughs> Microsoft. They are companies that completely disassemble and re-engineer the code and pull out all the crap that can make it insecure. And then they don't talk about it. <laughs> that is a good point. I mean, yes, uh, you know, you always hear about... Um, 
uh, what is it? The, uh, you know, back in the day, the Obama phone and stuff like that, that was, yeah. you know, this hyper secure brick that no one could touch. Well, and then the other aspect is if these are such specialized products, although, you know, theoretically something like, you know, a, a Surface Pro 7 or that uh, Dragon or Elite Dragonfly laptop, these are, I, I think what makes this interesting is that they're not just putting this in, you know, these chunky business laptops that everyone is going to not want to use or maybe not necessarily want to use, but are going to use their personal machine more because that's just a better experience or something like that. You know, the Surface Pro 7, the Elite Dragonfly, at least these are these, the signal that these are going to be devices that will appeal to kind of the consumer instincts, even if these are applied to business customers. So, you know, having a trusted platform uh, that has these features, theoretically putting that out there and putting them in desirable, you know, machines, it's not a bad thing, right? Okay, sure. <laughs> All right, let's talk about some money, Tom. We have the first earnings report out uh, since IBM acquired Red Hat, and they kind of rolled that into their earnings report. So in Q3, IBM reported earned $2.68 a share on revenue of $18.03 billion. That sounds great. That's a lot of money to me. But analysts had expected revenue of $18.22 billion. So, you know, what's $200 million off on earnings of $2.67 a share? Like I said, this is the first quarter, uh, including revenue from Red Hat. Uh, and over, uh, but it still didn't stop the company from falling consecutive uh, for the fifth consecutive quarter in revenue down 4% overall on the year. Red Hat revenue grew 19%, helping IBM's cloud and cognitive software unit increase revenue 6.4% to $5.28 billion. So that's a substantial part of their revenue at this point. Global Technology Services, which is kind of the bread and butter of IBM, generated $6.7 billion. So you can see, a, you know, kind of approaching parity on the cloud end there, but down 5.6% in the year. Systems revenue, which is, hey, all those mainframes, uh, decreased 14% to $1.4 billion. And they're saying that's mainly to the end of life of the Z14 mainframe computer. Uh, congrats for uh, mainframe nerds. I'm sorry that that's going away. IBM is seeing growth in the cloud, but can they grow fast enough to offset these declines, basically either declines or stagnation in all other aspects of their business in the long term here, Tom? Last buggy whip manufacturer wonders why saddle business is not saving them. <laughs> um, and and honestly, I, this, this this hurts a little bit as a former IBMer. Um, you know, shout out to Global Services for for keeping the end up. But look at look at what IBM is. IBM used to be everything that had blinky lights on it, and now we've reduced it to cloud and AI, um, global services and mainframes. That's it. That's all of IBM. Tom Watson's IBM is dead, and I've been saying this for years. What we have now is like the shell of IBM Global Services and mainframes and anything they couldn't sell off to anybody else that wouldn't take it. Hell, the only reason they still have cloud and cognitive services is because it used to run on the mainframes. <laughs> Ultimately, here's what's going to happen. IBM is going to continue to shrink. Um, I anticipate that what is currently Red Hat will eventually transform into some kind of a separate business unit inside of IBM, and that will continue to do the Red Hatty things that it does. But we are going to eventually see the transformation of the thing formerly known as Tom Watson's IBM into like like the last buggy whip manufacturer. They're going to keep the lights on for all the AS400s that they've been selling for the last 75 years. And ultimately, nobody's going to care. And if you don't believe that, ask yourself how many key people actively maintain COBOL code in the world. Guess what? The answer is not a million and it's not zero. And the fact that you don't know what those numbers are tells you that there's still room in that market to play, but nobody's going to get rich doing it. Yeah. Um as long as there are airline booking systems, I feel like IBM still is going to be able to pull down a cool billion dollars off of uh, their mainframe business to keep that alive. But yeah, it, um, it, I think that's an interesting prediction uh, in terms of Red Hat going forward. I mean, clearly, you know, there, there's room for growth there, even bundle, you know, uh, taking the, the wider growth of Red Hat into that cognitive services uh, business unit, still seeing growth overall. So, I mean, do you, do you see that in you know, a year, five years, well, like what, what five years, five years, five years, uh, a year is still too soon for wall street to give up. Mm -hmm. Um, and five years is realistic roadmap to rearrange the pieces in the jigsaw puzzle to make it look more like a AI flower or something. All right. Let me, let me set my Siri reminder, uh, for five years and, uh, we'll follow up, uh, at that point. One thing we'll, uh, we might also have to follow up with is how Microsoft's doing with all these acquisitions. They've made 12 acquisitions so far this year. Uh, and they recently acquired the cloud file migration provider mover for an undisclosed amount. 
Microsoft execs say the goal is to help customers uh, migrate uh, Microsoft 365, Windows, Office 365, and Intune bundles uh, as you know as part of the reason for the acquisition. Other Microsoft tools for cloud migration include Fast Track and SharePoint migration tools. Mover supports migration from cloud service providers like Box, Dropbox, and Google Drive. The acquisition, though, comes a month after Microsoft acquired another cloud migration company that's called Moveray. It's Mover with an <laughs> E at the end. And, it, and and like I said, these are 11th and 12th acquisitions of the year. So, Tom, is the cloud as the cloud landscape matures, I was so excited about my mic, as the cloud landscape matures, is cloud migration the next big battlefront? Yes. And it's not just cloud <laughs> migration. It's getting your data into the cloud and then never letting it leave again. Um, <laughs> Holding it to well, you. I, exactly. Right, right here. Um, look at, like you said, Microsoft has been making a lot of acquisitions. Yeah, big deal. Companies buy people all the time. But it's all focused on getting data into the cloud. It's all focused on making cloud easier to use. It's all you know guaranteed to increase Microsoft's ability to get people to go to Azure. That's good. Well, and then Amazon does Amazon does some of this stuff too, but not nearly as much. I mean, they'll send a semi truck to your facility to <laughs> snowmobile everything in, but that doesn't look cool. Well, and yeah, and, and I wonder though if over time this will be maybe the downfall of the the Satya mania, right? Because it's in Microsoft's best interest to be open to all of the ways to ingest data, right? So not to so so really to be. Uh, platform agnostic in terms of, yeah, you don't need to run Windows, but we'll migrate everything over to run on Azure. You know, we'll, we'll take however you want to give it to us. We'll take it and, and sell it back to you as a service, essentially. I wonder if, you know, when we hit that point of, you know, maybe a pendulum swings back, we want to move stuff uh, back on prem and all of a sudden, you know, moving data out of there is when we will see kind of the the reaction to the Sacha mania of, oh, no, 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 we're still Microsoft. We like the money and the data. Uh, good luck prying that uh, from our cold cold uh, hands. I, I'm i curious though. Um, also, mover and mover, whatever, it sounds like you're declining Latin uh, at that point. Um, so we'll see uh, uh, We'll see what the infinitive of uh, movare is. We'll go forward. Latin jokes. We got them all day, folks. Uh, next up here, Tom, we had some updates. Uh, the Federal Communications Commission formally approved the merger of T-Mobile and Sprint. This had been rumored for some time. Uh, Ajit Pai has kind of publicly said that he had no problem with it and would recommend it going forward, but it's become official now. Now the companies must deal with a bipartisan coalition of states' attorneys general who are suing to block the deal. Sprint and T-Mobile have said that they won't close the merger until the lawsuit is resolved. Interesting wrinkle, though. They've already seen some uh, states drop out of that uh, multi-state lawsuit. Colorado, being the latest, uh, left the coalition after T-Mobile and Dish promised 5K or excuse me, promised 5G rollout targets in the state and bringing 2,000 just jobs to the state as well. Is this deal effectively done, and the companies just have to kind of spread around enough incentives to the states here, Tom? Yeah, that's basically what this is, is that the FCC wants to ramrod this deal through for, I don't know, competitive reasons. But realistically speaking, if the FCC is given the blessing, then the states are just kind of piling in to get a little sweetener on mm -hmm. things. Um, ultimately, I think here's what's going to happen. Um, this merger is going to happen. Sprint will get consumed into John Laguerre's house of fun and, and fancy. <laughs> um, and this will not move the needle at all. Um, realistically speaking, most people have set themselves up as one of the two big carriers, AT&T or Verizon. There are a lot of people who use T-Mobile and they're proud to tell you that they use T-Mobile, but Sprint doesn't really affect this at all. So what you'll get is the customer accounts are going to stay the same. They're going to trade back and forth. I hate AT&T. I'm going to go to Verizon. I hate Verizon. I'm going to go to AT&T. T-Mobile is going to steal some customers because we run crazy Eddie deals all the time. <laughs> and in five years, the assets of Sprint that nobody wants will be sold off to, I don't know, Boost Mobile or somebody. Well, no. Yeah. So Dish is taking on a lot of those supposedly to become a fourth national carrier. So my I, what, what is interesting to me is, you know, one of the ways that T-Mobile has spurred growth is they've been very aggressive in licensing spectrum out to uh, uh, mobile virtu or virtual mobile network operators, whatever the acronym uh, for that is. Basically, everyone out there runs on some version of either T-Mobile or Sprint. Enough of those are coming into house and you have Dish 
gaining spectrum and setting themselves up as a fourth national carrier. I do wonder if T-Mobile will shift their their focus on that and maybe be less aggressive on that. And that will become the dish, you know, the kind of the dish bailiwick going forward. I think it will be because MVNOs don't make money. And if you don't realize that, realize that Disney had an MVNO at one point. <laughs> and they don't now. And there's a reason for that is because it's a dumb idea. Well, it, it's a dumb, it, is it a dumb idea for the companies? But hey, here's a bunch of money and here's a block, you know, license to use X amount of spectrum. And by the way, we're going to throttle you anytime. You know, you're the first one to be throttled and the last one to be unthrottled, right? Yeah, nobody's going to care about this in the long run. And if you don't believe me, what's the fourth biggest cloud provider out there? And if you say Oracle Cloud, I'm going to smack you. <laughs> it was going to be Oracle. Oh, no. Please don't come over. Tom and smack me. Uh, and finally here, uh, speaking of smacking, uh, the Air Force smacked down some old uh, uh, storage mediums. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Jason Rossi announced that the Strategic Automated Command and Control Systems, or SACS, has moved to a highly secure solid state digital storage solution in June. You may say, oh, that doesn't seem like a big deal. Well, previously, the system ran off 8-inch floppies on an IBM Series 1 computer from the 1970s. That could also be why uh, IBM Systems revenue was slightly down uh, this quarter. <laughs> SAX is one of the many duplicative systems used by U.S. Strategic Command to send emergency action messages from nuclear command centers to forces in the field. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't entirely based on floppies. This was one of many systems that were doing this. Good to modernize, Tom. Or word that they're disrupting a process that, you know, antiquated, but it worked? So there was a really old post that a friend of mine, Matt uh, Simmons, had about why are there still ashtrays on airplanes, even though you can't smoke on them anymore? And it turns out that once you've certified an airframe with all the pieces in it, and you pull one of those pieces out, you have to recertify the whole airframe, no matter how trivial it is, oh. including ashtrays. I get it. We, we, we don't want to have to try to read eight-inch floppy disks anymore. And having one time touched a computer that uses eight inch floppies totally understand but <laughs> you're first of all you're gonna have to recertify everything and i know that the air force has done a really good job of this and let's be fair the likelihood of a full-scale nuclear launch against a major uh theater-wide actor anymore is well it's not zero but it's a number that's really really small so i'm not necessarily worried about that chain falling apart as long as they do their job uh what i am worried about though is they replaced it with solid state media awesome um ssd drives expire um you know even if you never write to them or you never read from them after what about eight to ten years the electrical charge and the ssd cells just it vanishes. Mm. Um, they, they're going to have to have these on some kind of an upgrade cycle because if they don't, um, we're going to wake up one day and War Games is going to seem like a, a really uh, a, a, in a hopeful and inspiring way to deal with, you know, I don't know, uh, when the aliens invade Area 51 and we need to nuke them before the giant alien robot destroys San Francisco or some stupid thing like that. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think everyone, when they saw this headline, uh, you know, kind of left like, oh, 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 the you know military is using floppy. How antiquated. I, you know, I, I want to hear the other side. You know, there, there's always uh, discussions of government waste and stuff like that. That was a really solid investment <laughs> for the Air Force yeah. for 50 years to be able to use this one system. Uh, and, uh, you know, as long as it was effective, you know, uh, you know, hey, floppies, give them some love, guys. It's uh, it's OK. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I will always give love uh, to my co-host, Tom Hollingsworth, for being my co-host on the show. Tom, thank you so much for being here. Much appreciated. Where can people find more of your great stuff if they are so inclined? I am all over the internet. Um, specifically, you can find me at networkingnerd.net. Twitter handle is Networking Nerd. Sometimes snark, sometimes Larry Ellison jokes. Um, uh, GestaltIT.com is where I've been doing a lot of writing focused on the industry as of late. I've got some great coverage posts coming out from some of our previous events, as well as some briefings that I've taken recently. I just posted one about some of Aruba's new uh, switch announcements. You'll want to go ahead and dig into that because there's some good stuff there. Excellent. And you can find me on gestaltit.com or on Twitter at Mr. Anthropology. That just about does it for the show this week. We'll be back next Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time live on Facebook, facebook.com slash gestaltit, running down the IT news of the week. Uh, until then, remember, everybody, from me, from Tom, from all of us here at the Gestalt IT family, to have a super sparkly day. <laughs>